I'm James Holder. Welcome to Full Core Football 24. Quite privileged to be joined by former Manchester United, Exeter City star, and now sports lecturer, none other than Alan Tong. How are you, Alan? All right? Yeah, not so bad. Thank you, James. Thanks for inviting me on. Ah, pleasure to have you on, mate. It really is. Um, I hope, firstly, everything's OK where you are and things haven't been too testing with the second lockdown. Yeah, it's, it's like, you know, we keep saying it's, it's tough for everybody at the moment, isn't it? We've got you know, lots of issues that are still apparent and, um, you know, every, everybody's trying to, to get back to some level of normality. Well, that's really taking time, isn't it? And, uh, you know, we just hope with this vaccine now that we can maybe hope that 2021 will be a better year than this, this year, James. So I think that's what everybody's keeping their fingers crossed for, really. Indeed, indeed. I want to look back on your footballing journey today in your life. It's a very interesting story, which I want to get into today into so many facets of. What area did you grow up in as a child? Yeah, I was from, uh, I was brought up in a small village called Little Eva, which is, uh, it's not the most popular place on the English map. I don't think many people have, uh, have, will have heard of that, unless you live in Little Eva, of course. But it's a small village, James, just outside Bolton. So I was, uh, I was kind of brought up there and spent most of my, my formative years uh, in Little Eva and uh, you know went to school there in the areas and um, before I started sort of transitioning and moving on to other places around the country that was kind of my, uh, my sort of early experiences. Tell me a little bit about your family dynamic did you have a lot of siblings growing up and stuff? Yeah well I, um, I've i got a sister unfortunately I had a, you know I had a brother unfortunately I lost my brother uh, not too long ago October 16th so I was, I was um, I was brought up as a, a twin, uh, unfortunately. Uh, a lot, I lost him, which was really, you know, really sad down this last month or so. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, you know, we we were all all had interest. Me, me dad especially. We we kind of had the real interest in football from an early age because it uh, tend, tends to happen quite a lot in families, doesn't it? Because you know, if you, if your parents are interested in the sport, it usually is passed down, and uh, you know, you you've nine times out of ten have an interest in the sport as well, and. You know, and that, that's exactly how it worked out with myself. You know, I can remember playing in the gardens, uh, you know, from, right from early years, I had a ball at my feet and, you know, re recreating special times. You know, we always used to sort of use the uh, dynamic of, uh, you know, the last minute in cup finals or the last minute to win a league title, all this all this imagery stuff. And, and it's strange, James, you know, because my dad was a United fan, it's really weird how it worked out because Man United always used to win in the last minute. So, uh, you know that that's kind of kind of how some of the play worked out for myself in the gardens and and sort of moving on moving that on to sort of go through my, my primary school years and into my secondary school years. What's your first memory of playing competitive football? Whether that be for your local team, whether that be for the school side, how did that initial interaction in the game come about for yourself? Yeah, I, th I think I was about eight year old at the time, and um, you know you're just playing sort of football in the. You know, primary school. Remember the the bell used to ring, and uh, there was a teacher there. He used to have like a ball in a cupboard, and uh, it was like as soon as the bell went, he was like sprinting to this teacher, and he it was almost like this this incredible feeling when he was passing the ball to you, and it's like you know shooting down the stairs at the primary school to get out onto the grass to to go and play a little bit of football for a quarter of an hour, twenty minutes. Um, so so kind of that was one of my early conscious memories, and then. As I was kind of getting involved and starting to play on, on, on the local fields near to where I lived, I think it was a neighbour who said uh, there's like a junior side who do some training at a sports centre um, on a, I think it was like a Sunday afternoon, you know, like four till five or something. So anyway, um, I think I got invited down there. I just said, oh, come, come down and, and just join in and, and sort of have a, you know, have a, have a, little, have a little game and that. So I went down and... Um, I remember, like, I mean, really strange, isn't it? What things stick with you? I, I did really well on that on that moment, and I had, um, you know, it was only like five or side goals, and it was uh, like in a sports hall. I remember getting the ball, and I managed to go past one player, then another player, and I just smashed the ball and just went right in the top of the five or side net. And uh, I remember, like, the coach saying, "Oh, unbelievable! What a strike!" And then afterwards, we went in the changing rooms, and there's like a like, an award for player of the week, and. Uh, and the fella, the, the coach said, oh, we're going to give it to like Alan this week, you know, and, and that was the first time I'd been down. So, like, I felt 10 foot tall coming out of there. So, so you know, you talk about this, like, recreation of development of identity around sport. 
you know, even even going back to that as young as eight and nine, you can recall it with like vivid clarity. So, uh, so like in relation to me, our like early conscious memory of football, I think that would probably be the the one that sort of sticks in in the mind. How did you progress from there then? Would you be playing district football, like the district county at the time? Would you have been playing at a higher level on the weekend? How did that development then transcend? Yeah, so I started off, I played for a, like a, a local team called Farnworth Boys. I was, uh, I must have been showing some promise, James, because it, you know, back then it was quite off. You often heard of players playing a year young or two years young, you know, if you had a bit of ability. So I used to sort of play like nine, ten year old, but I'd be in an under 11 side. So that was like my early grassroots kind of memory. And, you know, going back to those days, the, the, the pitches were kind of a, a little bit of a, uh, a mud bath on most weekends and you know he's always used to to see these giant goals as well that you think to yourself you know if you've got a relatively decent shot on you at nine ten years old and like you've got a little keeper and a massive full-size goal if you can hit it all right you've got half a chance of scoring I know that as football's developed into the modern day and you get all the sort of seven aside size goals and the 9v9 and stuff like that they've, they've shrunk a little bit but yeah, it wasn't unheard of there to be, to be playing on 11 v 11, under 11. So, um, you know, it was quite it was quite interesting. It's one of them situations where you got a touch of the ball. You might you might not get another touch of the ball for about 10 or 15 minutes. Appreciate how hard it must have been and how hard it was for youngsters at 10 to play on these full-size pitches. Because I remember yeah, it in yeah. my generation. The pitches are absolutely huge. Like yeah. you say, you've got the tiniest of goalies. Do you think it's better now that it's been slightly changed for the... Yeah. I, th I think um, you know you don't. There's a lot of research in there that shows that from a technical perspective, you get a much more touches now on the ball. Like naturally, if it's a seven v seven or nine v nine, as you as you're coming through the age groups, and you know back then you like you, you got the you know you're a nine ten year old playing on a full size pitch. It's, it's quite this. Let's let's just say this. There was plenty of space on there, and you know and it, it makes you laugh James you know going back into those days there was I can't remember or recall many games getting called off we used to play with massive puddles and goal mouths there was mud all over the place and you know I think it was just sheer pleasure and enjoyment of going playing and I can't remember much games getting calls on Saturday and Sunday mornings to say oh, games off this morning I used to play all sorts snow hail rain thunder you know I think it was just a case of getting out there so I think as the generations have developed I think there's a little bit more care now and a little bit more safeguarding going on but you know back back then your formative years it was just a case of like just enjoying your football and you know really really playing in any conditions and you know, it was quite quite fun and interesting in times especially when the the ball got stuck in the puddle get about seven eight nine ten lads all try to kick the ball to get it out of there and uh, I say good times good good memories good fun do you remember getting scouted for that team initially because I'm guessing Bolton would have been the local local side for you at that time yes so what what happened James I started to you know I was obviously showing a little bit of ability and I managed to get involved I think it must have been through my primary school they sent a load of lads down to play in like a Bolton under 11 side you know like known as the town team back then so from that under 11s I stayed right through then till under 16s because it was a bit different back then you know a lot of a lot of the modern day you have like your training sessions just in the academies now and they're a little bit they're a little bit, um, they, they don't like you playing with a grassroots side. You know, if you're signed to an academy, you know, they, you're there like sort of, not full time, but you're committed to that. Whereas, you know, when I was coming through the system, you played Saturday morning, Sunday morning. Or Saturday morning might be like with your, you know, a junior side in your club. And then Sunday morning, you go and turn out for your grassroots side. So it was quite, it was quite interesting, like the different structures back then. So in relation to sort of like playing, uh, representing my town, I got, I got scouted uh, whilst I went to the next level. I played for Ma Greater Manchester County. So there was a couple of, you know, decent, decent uh, players at that level because you'd gone into like the best of your town. So, you, you know, in, within Bolton, so I was selected for that. And then the county was like, like the best of your, of, your, of your district. So your best of your Oldham and Stockport and Salford and... Rochdale, anywhere in Greater Manchester, so that that was quite a thrill as well. So it was it was in then that, that I first sort of like started catching the eye of of the United scout, and it was in a, it was in a Greater Manchester County game on Macclesfield Town's ground against I think it was Cheshire, and uh, he approached me dad and my mum and dad after the game, and he said we'd like to invite Alan down 
to come and train with, with United over the Christmas period. And his, his, his words were, we, we've never, you know, he, he, for a fullback, he gets forward really well. And he said, it's very rare that you can cross a ball with quality like he does. So that was kind of like the first kind of interest and kind of uh, feedback I had from like a scout at United. And, and uh, that was it. I was getting all set then, ready to, to go on trial with them. Explain to me that excitement, especially with your dad being a Manchester United fan, of even mm. getting scouted and getting that, that initial uh, invite to come and trial with the United Academy. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, you know, like being a United supporter and, and going back into the past where me, you know, my memories are of cup finals and exciting games and, you know, United, you know, history goes way back into the 50s with the Busby Babes and then Bestie and Bobby Charlton and then into the 70s and 80s with like, you know, Brian Robson, Norman Whiteside, you know, like really, really top time and like sort of top, uh, football club so so it wasn't just United I, I went down to City I was down at City they, they offered me to to sign with them uh, Bolton offered me schoolboy forms as well and I was doing, I was going to like a few trials and it was kind of the mantra back then it's like don't hang on and don't you know just just delay don't sign anything don't commit yourself yet um, but I think the difficulty is when you when you kind of like got United you say like we'll offer you something it's hard to sort of say oh, I'm going to wait and weigh up the options so so I, uh, I signed on the dotted line for United as a schoolboy. So I took me up to up to 16 and then they offered me like an apprenticeship as well, tagged on to that. So from about 14 and a half, 15, James, I, I knew what I was going to be doing when I was leaving school. First impressions of the cliff, the training ground, first time you went there, what, what do you remember? Yeah, very, very special. You know, you remember wandering through the gates and... Uh, you know, almost like the feel, the feels there of the of the Busby Bays, like the ghost of them, and you know, like a very, very historic place. You know, I think the cliff uh, was built, or it was, it was. I think I'm not sure if it was an old rugby ground in the 30s or something, and then it developed, and United kind of got their uh, hands on it and started training there, and you know, like quite, quite a lot of historic uh, experiences at the cliff, but. But yeah, I mean, I remember turning up. Used to we used to I trained in the school of excellence first of all. So we used to expect you to go on a Monday night and a Thursday night, and the training was something like um, I think it was six to eight or, or half six to half eight, something like that, a two-hour session. Uh, so you'd go into the changing rooms, and you're just like, you know, the kit, the kits would be like not not <laughs> not all laid out for you. It was like just putting a, a a melee like shorts, socks, shirts all on this bench. So it was like, yeah, you had like 15, 20 lads who were, who were down there at the time. They all used to get stuck into that. And I remember it was like, a, you had a yellow shirt on, like blue shorts, uh, little socks or no shin pads or anything. And, and like, used to wear like samba trainers back then because we used to train on the AstroTurf, which was the indoor part. And then just walking from that changing room over to the AstroTurf, James, with that kit on just made you feel 10 foot tall, special. You know, just having that, that training stuff on and, and go into, you know, to train and play in, in this historic place. But I always used to laugh that the indoor AstroTurf at the cliff was freezing cold. It was colder. It was colder in there than it was outside. Absolutely Baltic. And it was one of them places where, you know, you could, you could see your breath and like it was, yeah, just, just an absolutely freezing cold. It, and it wasn't the best of surfaces either, to be fair. You know, like AstroTurf and 3G and 4G has developed since then. You know, you've got some like, you know, almost like synthetic grass stuff now. Like, it's, it's almost like real, real grass that you're playing on. But back there, the AstroTurfs weren't the best. A lot of sand on them. Uh, if, you, if you slid on them, like you've got like burns all over your legs and stuff like that. So, but yeah, from a, from a sort of a first memory perspective and starting the process there, that was kind of... Uh, like the first, the first conscious experience I had of like training down at United. We see Eric Harrison and the influence he had in particular on the class of 92, how important he was to the development of those players. Who was your youth team coach or manager? Who would have had the most involvement with yourself on a day-to-day -day basis at Manchester United? Well, it was it was Eric. It was Eric mainly. Uh, Eric Eric sort of led the training. You know, anything anything from under forties, under fifteen onwards. You know, Eric was the youth team manager, the under eighteens. But I think I think you know from my 
development and my experiences going from the grassroots into the full-time game it was very different you know I had a, I had a lot of praise from an under 15s under 16s coach at, where I used to play at grassroots called Tony Molden it was an old centre forward who used to play for Man City called Paul and, and Tony was his dad and he, he was um, he had a coach alongside him called Billy Howarth and, and Billy's son had a little bit of a short career as well but those two lads were massive in my development because they used to encourage me, they praised me, they they got for a couple of years, they got the absolute best out of me. But then when I went into United, it kind of differed a little bit and I think I found that challenging. You know, Eric, Eric was very harsh, he was very, uh, you know, like old school style, Sergeant Major style, you know, very, very, very tough, you know, tough to deal with limited praise. You, you'd get it on occasion, but it wasn't, I think it was it was really earned when when he got it. It was more likely to give you dressing downs or to be a bit stubborn or a bit stern with you. So I found that transition from the kind of grassroots game at the time going into the the full time under 18s experience quite difficult and quite challenging. Um, and again, I think you, you talk about identities and how it affects you. You know, I, th I think I think that kind of affected me in in quite a quite a substantial way really because. You know, Eric, although he was, he was the good thing about Eric, he was, he was honest with you and he was blunt with you, but sometimes a bit of praise helps you, doesn't it, at times? And, you know, it helps with your development and it helps with your learning, it helps with your motivation, it helps with your engagement. So I, I find that, I found that quite challenging, that step. But unbeknown to me at the time, it was like, you don't realise why he's so harsh with you and it's only till later on that you kind of sort of understand that. And that is like, if he's not harsh with you and he's not tough with you and, and you're actually developing the pro game, the game's riddled with tough experiences. It's almost putting a foundation in to help you survive and, and flourish and, and move on and get better in the pro game. And if, if you speak to a lot of the lads who, 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 who come through under Eric, you know, like Giggsy, Paul Scholes, Gary Neville, the Nicky Butt, the, um, Phil Neville, um, Beckham, and then, you know, other players as well that are around the time, they'll tell you in autobiographies and within podcasts and dialogue what a tough man he was. And I think, I think you know, the values of that work for me later on in my life and not necessarily in the football environment. Because I started to realise that, you know, life's a tough journey. It's not fair. You know, life's not fair, unfortunately. And I think with that, almost like that covert development, and that covert resilience that you were picking up and that covert culture and those experiences that you were getting, I think it helped me later on with transitioning and, and coming out of football. So, so I think that, that's kind of been my, my sort of experiences of Eric. Football was in a different era to what it was back then. Methods have changed, the way coaches interact with young players. I watched in the Class of 92 documentary that Eric Harrison's wife even said that he was a bit hard on some of the some of the kids, and would he treat his own son like that? Have you any examples or anything that sticks <laughs> with you from Eric's behaviour from that period with with some of the players that he was coaching? It was brutal, really. <laughs> it's the best way I can describe it. Really, it was you know it was kind of a, uh, I think things and drills and you know, experiences that are happening back then that wouldn't have there'd been absolutely nowhere near in modern football and. You know, and it's not. This is not just me talking about this. This is, you know, you read, you know, some of the class of '92 lads will tell you as well. You know, the, Gary Neville alluded to the culture and the, organ and the, and the environment within his autobiographies. I think Scholes is said, you know, he's mentioned stuff that was going on there. Beckham's mentioned stuff that was going on there. So it's, you know, it's, it's out there. And the thing with Eric is, he, he was just, uh, he was just like, he wanted to win all the time, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. So a couple of examples where. You'd be playing on the cliff, and then what Eric could usually do, he'd watch the game from uh, up in one of the windows. So you had the pitch, and then above the cliff training ground was like the canteen, the manager's office, the coach's room, uh, the physio, like and they all windows across the top, and he'd watch the game from one of those. And it wasn't it wasn't uncommon to hear the window going, you're like smashing on the window if people, someone would give the ball away, or or there'd been an error, or you got caught out of position sometime. So that was one. Uh, another thing he used to hate, Eric, which again, he's trying to develop players. He's trying to bring players through as, as tough as they can be to try and get a career in football. 
he used to hate players turning the back on the ball because his argument was, well, you're getting paid now for football. So if you get a ball in the nether regions, you know, tough luck, you're getting some money for it and some wages. So if he caught you going like that when someone was having a shot, you know, he'd, 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 <laughs> he'd hang you on the crossbar at the cliff or Littleton Road and he'd get lads half volleying balls at you from the penalty spot. Obviously, it's very, very difficult to turn your back when you're hung on the bar, isn't it? Because you're like that, so you have to kind of like try and get the balls away. But, hey, oh, luckily, I learned very quickly that he had to be brave, so he, he didn't catch me. I, I wasn't uh, involved in, in those drills, but I observed some of the drills that, that, that were going on. Not, not in a nasty manner or a, or a sort of, you know, he's trying to humiliate anybody. So he's just try, it was just his way of trying to get a point across. Did you feel that you're starting to develop at Manchester United? Did you feel that the coaching from Eric and the other coaches was taking your game to that next level? Could you see the improvement as a player yourself? Yeah, I, th I think. I mean, I, I had a really good start, James, at United, and I think I think I found the transition from Resi to first team the hardest. Uh, uh, went in at let's have a think here. So, at 15 years old, I was playing in under 18s, which is again, it's quite it's quite a substantial step that. Um, and there was um, a particular game that I played in where it was an interesting experience. It was a, it was a game that was it was um, it had gone over from last season, and it was pl we played Crew in, the, in one of the cup finals. And I don't know what had happened, James. I think Eric might have been struggling for players at the time because there might have been a few injuries. So he called a couple of the schoolboys in to play. But I was only fifteen at the time, so it's like you're playing in an under eighteen cup final. It's quite tough and challenging, like. On Gresty Road back then as well, the, the pitch wasn't the best. It was bobbly, it was hard, um, very bouncing. It's one of them where, like, sometimes in football, you get the ball, and it's like within seconds, someone's on you, closing you down. So it's it's like you have to make decisions very quickly. And I found that quite challenging because I was only a kid. I was only a schoolboy. So after the game, I think Eric was a bit harsh up with me. Like, he called me up in the, in the changing rooms and uh, he said to me, like, you know, you've been like, you're a dis you know, disgrace. I can't remember what words he used, but they weren't very nice. And anyway, on the Saturday, he called me. I was playing in a B-team fixture. And he said, like, oh, I, I apologise for the, the way I spoke to you on Thursday night. I was out of order for that. So, you know, he, he had that he had that sort of, um, that character to sort of realise. But at the time, I was only 15 years old. And it, it wasn't really nice because it was like, there's nothing worse. I think a lot of pros will tell you this. There's nothing worse than getting hammered in front of other people, especially when you're only 15, you know. So, anyway, 15 under 18s, played in the resis at 16. Um, I got chosen to to go on a, a trip with England under 20s when I was 17. We went to Russia to play a Russian team. So, early on in the United experience, it was going well. You know, I was, I was, I was playing at a reasonable level. We was winning things. We was winning new stuff. I mean... FA Youth Cup just eluded us, got to the quarters in the semi, got done by Tottenham, unfortunately. And, uh, you know, it always makes me think if we'd have beat Spurs in that year, you know, it's crazy to think you might not have heard of the class of 92 because a lot of the lads in that youth team who played in the semi final versus Tottenham, if we'd have gone past that and won it, you know, maybe we'd have got like the, the sort of the, the chances of playing in the, in the first team. So, so I think we were kind of knocking on the door, but not quite making that transition into the first team environment. I think sometimes in pro football it's about it's about timing. And I think I always I always laugh and, and pull my mum and dad's leg and say, I think I was born two years too early. If it, if they'd have waited, I would have been in that crop with Beckham and Giggsy and Scoldy and you know and all that. So I might I might have got a chance to come through then. I might have got some first team it's uh, a, a better first team profile and more first team opportunities. But the, the only one I had at United really was in a, in a friendly, a couple of friendly games that, they, that they'd uh, organised and I managed to be involved with them. But, you know, I think it, it, ju it, just, it just was out of my reach going from the reses and, and establishing myself as a, as a regular first team player. You know, maybe, maybe mentally, maybe psychology, maybe, I don't know, back then, James, the management and the coaches, they seem to make quicker decisions on you than they do now. Like, we've got the under-23s team now. So, if you're a young pro and you're doing okay and you play with England in the 20s, you might get a little bit more time to develop. Whereas, back then, if you're kind of not around the first team at 18, 19, I think they're sort of like making a quick call on you. You know, in relation to talent development, 
you know, arguably they said like maybe you should have got another year or two just to see how it was going. But um, that that was kind of like the experiences that, that I found. So when you're playing in the reserve team, as you mentioned, it's men's football. There's no under twenty threes back then, so you've got players coming back from injury. You've got first teamers that have been bombed out the squad, playing against real playing real players and stuff. How do you how did you handle that experience? Well, the, I think back then, I think that, you know, what I experienced at United was all the professionals, like there was no big egos in, in the dressing room back then. They were all, you know, I suppose a lot of them have all come from working class backgrounds. So they understood, you know, they, they'd been on, they'd been on your journey that you're on at the moment, like coming through as youth and that, you know, at various clubs. And, and I think one of the great things back then is the first team, the resis, the youth, they all signed up, like used to train together on occasions. You know, like I think these days in the modern world, it's quite disparate. You'll get like the youth team training together, or the resis on their own, or the under 23s on their own, the first team on their own. But back then, it wasn't uncommon for manager, coach, Sir Alex, Archie, Archie Knox would come down and say, Oh, we're having a massive five aside this morning on the cliff. There's 16 teams of six players each, six aside. And you, you know, you'd find in your team, you'd have like Gary Pallister or Brian Robson, and you'd have a couple of young girls, Mark Robbins. Or Daniel Graham, and then you'd be like with a couple of apprentices as well. Um, so it, it wasn't uncommon to like to mix in then. And I think from a resi perspective, it was always good to observe good players in action and see how they prepared. You know, watch them, see how they communicated, see what the social skills were like, observe what their decision making was like. So I think to have that mix was really, really good, and really, you know, it, it, it did bring me on a little bit. Um, Whereas in the modern day, I think it's a lot of age v age stuff. Like the 11s will play the 11s, the 13s will play the 13s, the under 23s play the under 23. I know you can have a couple of open age players in there or over 23, but a lot of the stuff, 18s as well, it's all age v age, and you don't get the opportunity to play with pros and senior pros. And you're right, James, some of these senior pros will be coming back from injury. We'd have like Paul McGrath coming back, Gordon Strachan. Uh, Stevie Bruce, uh, Dennis Irwin, Brian Robson, Norman Whiteside, they were struggling with injury. Chances are they'd be lining up in the A team or the resis. So to, to get that experience, I think, was was really good and, you know, uh, uh, fantastic memories. How did you get on with Alex Ferguson? Did you have much interactions with Sir Alex as a young player or would that have been handled by Eric and stuff? Yeah, Eric mainly. Um Sir Alex used to sort of uh, come in on occasion. I think one thing with Sir Alex was he was always interested in kind of what was going on in the youths. So it wouldn't be uncommon. How it worked back then, James, was you had um, the A or the B teams, which was the under-18s junior size. They used to play on a Saturday morning. And then the first team would play on a Saturday afternoon. I know in the modern world now it's very... You know, there's a lot of changeable fixture times. There's, there's teams kicking off at 8 o'clock on Monday nights, 4 o'clock on Sundays. But back in that era, like Sir Alex and Archie, had, if they were home, had come and watch the under 18s just to keep an eye, keep an eye out what was happening, and then they'd go on to the first team fixture then in the afternoon. So, so in relation to the relationship was kind of um, quite wide. He, I didn't really speak to Sir Alex a lot, but on occasion, if he came down, he wanted to speak to the players in general or stuff like that. He'd come in and impart some of his nuggets of wisdom or. You know, the, the first sort of, the probably the, the most prolonged uh, conversation I had with Sir Alex and my mum and dad was when I went in to sign at, at sort of 14, 14 and a half. Um, it was at, at the cliff, upstairs at the cliff, went in. Sir Alex was eating tea and toast behind his desk. Because I think it was, it was just before I was going into training, so about half five. Uh, and then I remember him saying to my mum and dad, like, you know, we're going to offer Alan uh, an opportunity to play here. And then just just typically just outlining uh, how difficult football is. You know, it's a tough environment, it's a tough world. You've got to be prepared to be disciplined. You know, all these all these words that we kind of hear commonly. And uh, I remember him saying it was quite random, but I stood up and he said, Can you "Just turn round a minute, Alan, for me." Anyway, he was looking at my legs and he said to me, "Mum and Dad, yeah, he's got good lines. He's got good lines on his legs. He'll be okay. He'll be all right. He'll be and they'll make a player." So. You know, you hear some stuff about Sir Alex weighing up the size of your mother because it gives you an indication of growth and things like that. And it's like I think he had like these nuggets that that used to impart sometimes. 
So, uh, so that was quite an interesting one. So that was kind of the most really I spoke to him. I mean, I was lucky, you know, Sir Alex was quite brutal as well in relation to standards. You know, if you didn't, if you didn't reach the standards he was after, he, he'd let you know. And again, you talk about cultures and you talk about different cultures, which it was back then. You know, everybody's heard of Sir Alex's hairdryer and, you know, even at under 18 level, he wouldn't hold back if he felt a point needed to be made. But at the end of the day, James, what was interesting back then is like, they're trying to build you, they're trying to build your character to sort of like move on to the next level. But you don't see it at the time, you don't understand it. You're almost like, they say there's a fine line between bullying and banter, or you know, you've got to be careful there. You know, and, and I think I wouldn't like to say Eric and Sir Alex were bullies. I wouldn't go that far, but they were certainly crossing borders or lines. You, you know, you, you have to be you have to be careful sometimes in relation to how you dress because we're only under 18s at the end of the day. There's a lot of 16, 17 year olds in dressing rooms. You know, and way back then, sort of 88 and early 90s, where I was involved in in that culture. You know, it was it was quite difficult to comprehend and work out why they were doing it. You know, it's. Maybe the communication practices could have been better. So they outlined it like, if they'd have said to you, look, you might get a little bit of this on occasions in relation to like, you know, it's for your own good and it's for your benefit. Don't worry about it. But it was almost like they're just testing your character to see how you, how you respond to things. But would it be my way? You know, I've been a lecturer for 17 years. It wouldn't. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be my way of doing stuff. But. You know, I can't argue with Sir Alex what he's done, you know, in relation to how he's evolved and and how he's, you know, took United from not really winning anything in the mid-80s up to early 90s and then it just kind of going on a, a sort of a, a journey of success, really. So, but, you know, with, with Sir Alex, you wouldn't see the hairdryer all the time. You know, this is just on occasion, so it's... You know, you've got to look at that other side as well. When people say, oh, the hairdryer was happening every week. It wasn't. But it was quite an interesting scenario when it when it did happen. Obviously, the most famous hairdryer that people talk about is David Beckham with the boot incident and Alex Ferguson. Is there any incidents of hairdryer stuff that you've seen personally that we we may not be aware of before that or round about that era? Well, he used to he used to sort of like I think there was a game you've seen game against City at Old Man City. It was in the Lancashire Youth Cup semi final. And uh, I think United were kind of trying to, you know, get a stranglehold of the of the youths in Manchester at the time. And City were kind of doing better. You know, City were winning youth cups. He had that famous 80s team that brought through uh, Paul Lake, Andy Hinchcliffe, Paul Molden. Um, they had um, Steve Redmond. They had the Brightwells. Uh, lots of good youth and good youth players that were coming through and they won the FA Youth Cup, I think it was like 86. I think they beat United in the final. So I think what Sir Alex was like trying to do is, is get the scouting and the youth systems better. So, you know, like United would get more of a stranglehold in that. Anyway, we got to the semi-final of the Lancashire Youth Cup on Old Trafford and uh, we lost 3-1, unfortunately. And uh, after, I think it was either, I think it was half time he come in and he let rip on one of like my, uh, my colleagues like him. And it was like, wow. And he used to go up, he used to go up like nose to nose with you and like stare you out and like all these expletives. That's why, you know, that's where the, the hairdryer comes from. But, uh, you know, to see it was like, it's kind of like in action, you go, wow. But, you know, a lot of other, you know, I'm sure first team players in autobiographies have spoke about I think Mark used coined the phrase, that phrase the hairdryer. Um, we used to, we, had, we used to have chores back then that you had to do after games, you know, like sweeping the, the corridors at United and cleaning the boots and there was often like where you'd be cleaning the boots and you could, you could hear behind the first team dressing room door and he was venting his spleen and that so it was uh, it was interesting but at the end of the day that, that was his way of, of expressing his emotions and getting out you know what he had to get out and the one thing he said was you know he never he never held a grudge with anybody he'd vent his spleen but then the morning after it's all forgotten about and we move on but I don't know. At that time, from from where I was there, late eighties, early nineties, I could never get my head around that. But there you go. Maybe maybe I was a little bit more of a maybe a cerebral, more sensitive player, more of a thinker, more somebody who needed maybe a different approach, like I got from Tony Molden and Billy in the Bolton Lads Club situation. You know, maybe venting your spleen and going nose to nose with myself wasn't going to get the best out of me. So it's kind of a bit of a a conflict of my personal identity 
against the identity of the culture at the time. At 18-19, when you're not making that step up from reserve team football into the first team, is there a realisation from yourself that you may not get an opportunity at Manchester United to prove yourself, that you may not get a chance to, to go further with the club at that time? Yeah, because you know it's it's tough. Like any 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 lad will tell you, who's coming through the system. You know, even even maybe harder now. You know, the, to to to. I think there's one thing. There's there's two stages to it. There's one thing getting in, getting your first team debut, and playing in the first team, and then there's the other challenge of staying there. You know, that that's there's kind of two different things going on. So I think what was kind of found, you know, a, bit, a little bit difficult in my time, was there was quite a lot of players who could sort of fit into the position that I played. And this, the sad part of the the, the, the the game back then is there were only we only had two subs. So you had like eleven first team players and then and then two on, on the Saturday afternoon. So the problem that I faced was from a fullback's perspective, if Viv Anderson had got injured, they put Clayton Blackmore there. If Clayton was injured, Lee Martin had come in. If Lee Martin got injured, they switched Dennis Irwin over. If Dennis was injured, they'd convert Paul Ince back there. So it's like you had like five or six players in front of you that, that you had to try and get in front of to get your opportunity. You know, and due to one thing or another at the time, maybe, you know, maybe there's a lot of psychology. Maybe I lacked a bit of confidence. Maybe I wasn't as assertive as I should have been at 18, 19. And I think, you know, in reflection, I think maybe that kind of let me down a little bit. Maybe I, I needed to work on my, my belief in myself a little bit more in order to maybe go and knock on Sir Alex's door and say, you know, is, is there any chance of getting a, a, an opportunity here in the first team, Sir Alex? You know, I heard, I was talking to somebody yesterday morning, one of the coaches that I work with, and they were saying about Wayne Rooney, went to David Moyes at 15 and said he feels as though he's good, as good as the forwards in Everton's team at 15 than they, than they are as, as pros. And you're thinking that, that has a lot of courage and a lot of self-belief to do that. And I think I think like looking at the situation that I was in at the time, maybe that's something that I could have developed a little bit more, more, more belief in myself. Maybe maybe there was a, a lot going on in the environment. Maybe there's a bit of inferiority complex going on and things like that. But a lot of players will tell you, James, inferiority complex in football does you no favours. You know, this is just this is not me speaking. I've heard this from like lads who've been in the England squads. When you see other players in action, you think to yourself, wow, they're good. They're good, but psychologically, you're not giving yourself, you know, the credibility and the credence that you deserve. So I think that you know, if there's any sports psychology work within youths or academies, you know, maybe that working on that, that self belief is such a crucial component in making the next step at elite level from reses under 23s into the first team environment. Can you remember the day? news was delivered to yourself that you wouldn't be going further with Manchester United oh brutal yeah they, I can and it was it was a strange one because we'd been chasing the the 18 title at the time so we, we got it we ended up playing four games in a week so we had a game on Saturday morning we had a game on Tuesday night a game on Thursday night and a game on Saturday morning so it's quite a brutal end to the season so anyway, we were chasing the title down. So we beat Burnley, I think it was. We went to Morecambe Reserves. Because how the A-team league worked back then, Jim, it was like a whole mixture of different teams. You had like Liverpool's junior team, City, Everton. But it was mixed with Carlisle Reserves, Morecambe Reserves. And they even had teams that played from the university. So we had like Umist in there. You know, the University of Manchester Institute in Science and Technology. They always used to finish bottom of the table, Umist. I don't think they won any game, but they were in there anyway. So what happened was we were chasing the title down and we had to go to Man City, who were the who were the the I think they were one point ahead or were on level points going into the last game. So it was a showdown at Platt Lane, like the old training ground that City had. Anyway, we managed to we managed to beat them 2 1 and we, we took the title, we did it. In the dressing room after, Sir Alex had been watching the game. He came in and he said to me, he said, You were unbelievable this morning. He said, You've been playing against a lad there who's been in City's first team. So it was an old player in the 80s called Jason Beckford. And he said to me, he said, you've not given him a kick on that, you know, in 90 minutes. He said, fantastic, son, unbelievable. So at the time, you're thinking after the game, oh, wow, getting some decent praise from Sir Alex there. And, you know, that, that sounds good, blah, blah, blah. 
Anyway, Tuesday after, I was sat in the dressing room at the cliff. Uh, Brian Whitehouse, who was the reserve team manager, came in and said, uh, Sir Alex wants a word. So I thought, here we go. Because you usually get a sense at the time, James, like contract negotiations. Again, very, very different to the modern day now because back then, no agents. That and agents have never really been heard of. So an, a an agent in the modern world would be looking out for you. So anyway, I went up the stairs at the cliff, <coughs> excuse me, knocked on his door. Yeah, come in. In you go. Uh, sorry, son, we're not going to, we're not going to be, we're going to have to move you on. Um, very blunt, very to the point. Uh, we feel as though that you're not making the development to become a regular first team player. And uh, we're going to, we're going to have to move you on, I'm afraid. We're going to have to, you know, like, see, you know, give you an opportunity to go and, to go and speak with other clubs and try and get yourself sorted out. So I come out the door, I think I, I just kind of, it was, I, I, I try to explain it, it's like, it was like your body crumbling, it's like, you know, like, you have like a massive trauma or a massive shock or something. And um, it was kind of like, um, bizarrely, I had to go out and train. <laughs> I, I had to go out and train at, uh, at Littleton Road after that news was delivered. So you, you talk, you know, you think about the care of people and the, the subjective stuff, and all all you want is someone to be treated as a human being and someone to be treated in the right manner. And it's like how I always term it is like a, it probably still goes on. You know, we need to we need to get more information around the modern practices, but you like thrown away like a crisp packet, an empty crisp packet. I think I've been at the club since I was fourteen and a half. I was nineteen. You know, I've been, I've been, I'd, I'd give it, I'd give it. As best as I could, I looked after myself, uh, tried my best. You know, to be fair, he, he wrote he wrote a lovely letter to me dad a little bit later on, and he was saying about you know Alan had give his all, and he said he was he was a credit to Man United. So what can you do? Um, so anyway, I went out training, and you just there's like a million and one things going on in your mind, and I remember thinking like somebody passed me the ball. I think it was Paul Ince. And they had like a fumbly touch on it because I just wasn't there. It was like Paul Lake's autobiography. I'm not really here. That's, that's how I felt at that moment. And he starts having a go and saying, oh, Tongi, you know, you can touch his crap and all that. And you're thinking like, I just might have my heart broke. <laughs> you know, and it's like people just didn't have a clue about the situation. And, you know, it was tough. That was like a brutal experience in your life. But, you know, out, out a tragedy comes triumph a lot of the time and you've got to take the knocks. You've got to go down on one knee. <clears throat> you've got to, you've got to take that that sort of smash across the back of the head that you've just had, and somehow, you know, try and knit your life back together again and, and move forward in in the best way. We know football is a brutal game. Not everybody's gonna take a spot into Manchester United, but when you're when you personally are delivered and told that news, when it's your dream, how how did you deal with it? How did you then? Try to put things back well, it's, it's tough because it's, it's, it's just like, you know, we, we keep saying this word identity. It's, it's a big part of who you are as a person. You know, you've been, you know, we right back at the start of the interview, I'm talking about playing in the garden at five, re recreating United's, you know, last minutes in cup finals. And then you've got all that build, all that build. You work hard, school teams, town teams, county, apprentice, young pro, you know, first team resis at 16, you're moving forwards and then, to sort of hear, to say like, you know, you're gonna, we're going to have to move you on is, you know, it's just like you feel, as a person, you know, we talk about the mental health and stuff like that in the modern days, you just, you're just wrecked for a spell because you don't know where you're going to be going next, what you're going to be doing. Uh, you don't know where your wages are going to be coming from. And I think, I think all I can describe that time, particular time, is just, just very lost. Very lost for a period of time where, you know, you, the, the lack of support and care it was just I tell you, but null, null and void. There was just nothing there. You know, and it's not just me saying this. You know, you speak a lot, a lot of players at the time, a lot of players in the modern world, in the modern game, and you know, they'll, they'll say the same things. You, you're just left to your own devices, and you know, I, th I think that's really sad. But at the end of the day, you know, what can be your greatest disappointment can turn into your, you know, your greatest moment, your critical moments. I call it loads of anxiety. Uh, loads of loads of opportunity to reflect and really 
you know, think about where you're going next, identify what you have to do to move on, and it gives you an opportunity to, you know, to, to really build something going forward. So, so I think some coming out of the trauma of that sometimes comes triumph, you know, which which is hopefully what what's what I've managed to do in the in the, in this period, you know, that the period since that happened, like many years on now, I've I've managed to push on again. But it's like anything else, you, you know, you ne you never forget these things. It's, it's always those moments that are most difficult that stay with you, you know, and that's right across different fields, different disciplines. You know, you, you never forget. It's like almost seared in the brakes. People say to you. You know, it must have been great at United, and it was. It was brilliant. There was some great experiences. Played with some fantastic players. Played from a boyhood club, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But you remember the bad times double. <laughs> you know, it, when somebody asks you, it's it's, it's it's the difficult moments that you re, that you can recall with vivid clarity, and not necessarily the good moments. I, I, that maybe somebody who's got a, an interest in how brain formation works might be able to explain that in a little bit more depth and detail. Was you invited to an exit trial? Did the club give you a list of potential clubs lower down the league that would have been maybe receptive to yourself going to train with or going to look at? <clears throat> yeah, I think Eric, Eric Harrison came and he said to me, I know a few people in the game, we'll try and sort you out. Okay, so that's, that's all right. So I'll speak, to, I'll speak to Bolton for you. Uh, I remember going to see Sir Alex to ask him if any, there's been any interest. He told me that a couple of teams were sort of like looking or, you know, like he mentioned Leicester, he mentioned Knott's Forest at the time. So I'm thinking, well, something's developing. A massive problem that I had back then was the pre-seasons were really long. So you used to finish your football in May time and you might not be back till about July the 8th. So unfortunately, what had happened was because my contract was running out and because coaches and managers went away. I think Sir Alex went to America for a spell. It's very hard to get older, so everything's... What, what's really strange and what's really heartbreaking is, and this is what you don't envisage at the time, the phone doesn't ring and you, you, you sat at home thinking, someone will be in touch tomorrow, someone will be in touch tomorrow, someone will be in touch tomorrow, and it just... Nothing happens. So, so what happened was, I started having to to do things myself. I was, you know, maybe doing things that maybe an agent might do for you now. I was ringing managers at like different clubs, Macclesfield Town I spoke to at the time. Is there any chance, you know, I've been released at United, I'm looking for a new club, will you, will you have a look at us? Um, so it was like quite bizarre really. So, so the, there's kind of the support was there in a way, but not fully realised. I think once you're going out the club, I think that you you know, I'm not probably in best terms. You could say that they're not bothered about you really anymore. You know, because you're going, so they probably want you out the doors as quickly as you can. And I think, I think that's really sad when a young kid's given like five and a half seasons that you know they've tried their best and all that. That's how you. That's what really disappointed me. That's that's what really hurt the most. What was your next move after that? How did you successfully get yourself back into football, back into a football side? Well, it was um, it came it came out of the blue really. I was um, I was I was trying to keep myself fit. Uh, I remember trying to get myself involved with a couple of different teams. I think I went down I went down to Bolton for a spell, and I don't know. I, I, I maybe maybe it's me being a bit um, let's let's think let's use the right terms here. Maybe a bit critical of all. Maybe a bit paranoid. But I'd knock them back at 15. And then you get this kid arriving at 19, like, oh, we look at us and give us a, you know, give us a trial and all that. And, you know, maybe there was that relationship where they felt, they felt well, he knocked us back at 15. So, like, there's no chance of getting, you know, and bringing him in. So, anyway, I was down there for a couple of weeks and they told me that they were happy with the players that they got. Well, that's fine. Not a problem. And then... Um, it was uh, when I was a first year apprentice at United, I got chosen for the England uh, representative honours, went to play Russia. And the manager of the party back then was Alan Ball, the old Cup, World Cup winner, and, a, and an old manager called Laurie McMenemy. And uh, Laurie McMenemy was uh, the manager of the party. Ball, it was like the, the sort of the assistant manager. And um, I think bizarrely, bizarrely, what it was, it was a phone call from a neighbour who'd spoke to Ball at Exeter 
and said, we've got a kid here who's been at United for four seasons. You know, he played in the res, he's just on the fringe of the first team. And uh, would you look at him? So I went down to Exeter um, and you know, I would, I'd laugh like I had a, a, an interview with the Exeter City website in the summer. And it was like, no disrespect to Exeter. I didn't know where Exeter was. <laughs> you know, I, I never heard of the place really. I think they were in League Two at the time. So the, the old kind of system as it was, you had like the Division One, Division Two, Division Three, Division Four. So I think Exeter were kind of in Division Four and Three when I went down there. And um, I went I went down to Exeter and got an opportunity and you know managed to take that and Paul offered me a contract and uh, I managed to get myself into the first team and I think I just started to get moving and get going again. So I had some great times. Played in some good games, some enjoyable games, and and uh, I kind of, you know, it, that that move kind of sort of, I suppose, made me grow up a little bit, like like somebody going to university at that age, you know, eighteen, nineteen, you know, because you you're like two hundred eighty, three hundred miles from home, and you're in digs with a, a few of the other players, and you know, it, it made me grow up. It gave me a foundation to to sort of like try and try and keep myself growth going. So so yeah so so I had some some really good times at Exeter. Uh, so I was there from from leaving United up until I think I spent five seasons with them from from sort of ninety one to ninety six. So so they they were they were they were, they were good moments and it like, it got me it got me moving again and, and got me and got me playing uh, in the football league playing league football. Was it a culture shock coming from training at the Cliff? I don't know. Manchester United was a different beast to what it is today but I mean going from what would be effectively League One to League Three did you notice a, a culture shocking within the, the players the training standards and everything that went along with, with moving club yeah I think at United you had you know all your kit was clean for you like you could get boots and trainers when you wanted um, you know, nice, nice stuff Exeter was, was a culture shock because you had to look after your own training kit you had to wash your own training kit uh, there was there was no canteen after training had finished. Like at the cliff, you could go and get some lunch and some dinner. At Exeter, myself and, and my mate at the time used to stop at like a, <clears throat> a little cafe on the way back and get like a tuna salad sandwich and you know just to get your dinner in. So so the the the, the resources as well, like United, they had like some some good equipment, some some nice facilities. Exeter had you know, like an old rickety weights room and like everything was quite small in the. In the in the training ground, and you know, but again, it wasn't that. Never ever bothered me things like that. I, I've never, you know, I come from a working class background. I, you know, I'm never, I, I was never one for opulence, and you know, like it, it, ne it never, you know, my, my dad, my family is the same. We're not that type of people. So like going, you know, culture shocks. Well, probably yes, but I didn't. My ego wasn't big enough to say I've, I've come from United here. I expect my training kit to. Nah, it wasn't like that at all. So, but I think I think that move to Exeter really was one of the best decisions I made. Like one, I had some fantastic times, and I'm still I'm still engaged with the club to this day. I do some radio work with them on Radio Devon for when they venture up into the north, and and it's been really nice to hook, hook back up with Exeter because they're a, you know a, a good little club and they're going in the right direction. So uh, that that was a, a good time. Did when you signed for Exeter, were you straight into the first team mix? Did Alan Ball get you straight in, or was it a case of now trying to earn your place within the side? Yeah, it, it took a bit of time. It took a bit of time. I've kind of like just getting myself, you know, fitter because it's it's crazy how you lose your fitness. You know, I, I think I don't think I went down to Exeter for a month or two, so it was a good few months before I, uh, you know, in between leaving United and then getting back in again. So a little window had took place. Maybe took, uh, took place. Maybe I'd lost my fitness a little bit. And uh, I think Bowley had me in the resis and you're know, playing in sort of some of the junior teams like the 80s, under 80, uh, sorry, under 20s or something like that at the time. Um, and then I think it was one of the players got injured, uh, uh, I think it was against Wigan Athletic. And he pulled me on the Thursday ball and he said, you're going to be playing Saturday. You're going to be making your league debut um, because the fullback's injured and we think you're, you know, you're a solid replacement in there. So, so I, I made my debut. It was quite an interesting experience. We lost one nil, eighty ninth minute winner for Wigan. We got halfway through the game and the, the team wasn't playing very well. 
the crowd started getting on the team's back, booing, what a load of rubbish and all that, thinking, crikey. I'm only 19 still, I'm just making my debut and, you know, that, that's it. you'll talk about culture shocks and, you know, welcome to first team football and, and that was that. So, so yeah, so it took a little bit of time, James, but after that, like, I managed to get start getting a, like, a run of the games going. I was a little bit in and out, it wasn't regularly, regular football, but I was certainly trying to break in there and had some good opportunities and, and then as, as I kind of like started developing and starting getting that opportunity, um, kind of my me, me second critical moment uh, happened, which was like a serious injury that, that I kind of picked up. So that was kind of uh, disappointing. I want to go into yeah. the injury a little bit. Did you know initially how serious of an injury it was that you'd suffered? I, th- I think what had happened one, one day, I was playing on a, like a frosty pitch and I'd gone up to win a header and I think I'd come down like on on me sort of like the top of my backside, bottom of me, me back sort of thing, like bang, like really hard. And then I kind of played on for a little bit. And then as as the kind of season was kind of progressing, I started to get really bad pins and needles in my feet and my arms and my legs. So I was like quite concerned. But I don't know whether this was through the experiences I've had in the past about toughness and resilience and digging in and keeping going, you know, all that, all that kind of things that you picked up in your apprenticeship and your, in your early years, pro years. But I kept playing with it. I kept playing with it because I knew that my contract was kind of coming to an end and I knew that I had to try and keep around, certainly involved and around the first team or else I wouldn't get another one. So quite stupidly, I played on with it for, I'd say, two or three weeks. Resi games, first team sub maybe come on off 20 minutes, but something wasn't right. Something wasn't right. I remember one game, we went to Swansea City away. I think it was, I think it was a league fixture. And uh, I said to my mate, like at the time, Coops, my Dave Cooper, my best friend in Exeter. And uh, it'd be interesting to see if Coops remembers this. I said to him before the game, like, I can't hardly move here. I've got to play. I've got to play right back tonight. Swansea have got a decent lad playing for him, Andy Leg. He, he was like, you know, a useful player. So I can't really move it. I remember saying to him, "What do you think I should do?" So I tell the ball, and he went, "Oh God, you, see, you can't tell." So it was, it was only like an hour and a half to kick off. So I thought, "Oh my God!" So anyway, I got a load of DP on my hand and just rubbed it. Yeah, rubbed it all over my spine and the bottom of my back, and just got on with it and managed to get through. So. You know, coming out of that later on and going to see the physio, because I could, that was it after that, no more. And I remember talking to a surgeon about it when he first sort of sent, sent us for, for x-rays and MRI scans. He said, one bad tackle in that game, that could have been severe. So you've, had a, you've got a bad injury, but that could have been severe because he said, all your discs are out of place. He said, you've got, you've got uh, uh, an area of your spine's missing. That's all the weakness that's gone. He said, you could have had something sever your spinal nerve if you'd have gone in that hard with somebody. Or, and I thought, so, my God, was football worth that? But I don't know. I must have been young and daft James, at the time and stupid and just try to, you know, keep going and all that sort of thing that they tell you to do. But that, that, was, that, was, that was a silly decision. And, and then after that, that was the kind of the beginning of the end for me. It was all, it was all sort of downhill after that. Like I had two operations on my back. I had screws and, uh, screws and plates inserted in the bottom of my spine. Uh, whew, tough, tough times. And that, I tried to come back. I had about 18 months of rehab. I couldn't get back to fitness. And then I think it come to, I think it was late 95, early 96. Probably the saddest letter I've ever got from the PFA saying, Alan Tonga, ex- contract player, Exeter City, has been advised by the surgeon the hospital that is... Playing career has come to an end. Uh, can you please uh, release his uh, benefits under the Football League insurance scheme? Uh, all the best, blah, 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 PFA. And that, that was the end. The saddest letter I've ever received through the post. And, and that was it. That, that was me finished. That was me done in, in professional football all, all over. Come to a, a premature end, unfortunately. How old was you at this stage? Pardon? How old was you at this I was I was 22 when I got the injury, so about 22 years old, and I, I was about just short of 24 when I had to uh, call time on it. So about 23 and three quarters. So I was there 
I was there to the end of that season. So they, they sort of made that decision and then I kind of finished like June, July, like contract had come to an end and that, that was me done. How did you handle that mentally? Bearing in mind you've spent your whole life preparing to play football. How did you deal with it? That you couldn't play anymore? I think, you couldn't apply yeah, I, th I think uh, there's a lot of theory, a lot of academic research that looks at, you know, in, in different stages, you know, just because we're talking about this specific to football, you know, you can administer this across different experiences as well. You know, people who've had tougher times and tough times and, you know, th and tough things to deal with. And that is, you go through stages, James, I think. I think in one of the stages I, I seemed to stay in for quite a lot was denial. I couldn't accept that I wasn't a footballer anymore. Um, and I, and I, had, I had a spell where I think 12 or 18 months just, just in the pub all the time, drinking bad going into bad habits, you know, like gambling a lot. Um, what else? Just just stupid behaviour, really. And I think it was, it, was all, it was all down to I couldn't... I didn't know who I was. I'd lost all that identity. Uh, and it, it, was, it was a tough, a tough kind of period because I, I, just, I just simply didn't know what to do with my next steps. You know, I didn't... I didn't, I didn't have, I wasn't really, well, you're not as a footballer, you're not qualified in anything else. You're like, you can't just step out of football and say, oh, I'm going to be a lawyer now. I'm going to be a lawyer within six months. I'm going to be a teacher within 12 months. So, co coaching, I wasn't really bothered about coaching, to be honest, because one, that it, it was difficult to get into because the playing staff was a lot smaller back then. If the injury had happened to me now, I might have got like the under 16s to coach or the under 14s or something. There might have been an opportunity for me. But unfortunately, back then, there was like balling manager, assistant manager, physio, somebody who headed up the youth, just one person, somebody who maybe looked after the reses, but that could have been the assistant manager. And there, was, there wasn't really not a lot of opportunities to stay in the game, if that makes sense. So I think one thing that's really good for younger players, certainly in the modern world, is there's more opportunities that have come to light. But that was no good for my generation, James. So I had to, I had to consider what I was going to do next, and I was just totally lost. I went through a series of jobs. I was working as a in a warehouse. I was working. Uh, I worked for the for the Royal Mail for a bit, sorting mail out. I did a lot of multi drop work, van driving. Uh, but it was, it was something that it wasn't really inspiring me to do that and, and that's no disrespect to mail workers or drivers or warehouse people but I just felt I had a little bit more potential that I need to realise in me and and that was to come to probably the best decision I ever made and that was to re-engage with my education again. Uh, Man United had put me through a BTEC in store you know as part of my apprenticeship and you know, bizarrely back then I, I didn't mind the education side because I'd come through my GCSEs I'd done all right I'd engage with the BTEC at United because I valued education. A lot of apprentices didn't. You know, they used to just turn up to college and do little. They'd probably play pool all day or they'd probably, you know, go disappearing at dinner. They weren't really into education, but I didn't mind it. So that was a, a kind of a side of me that I'm glad was there and, and you know, I, I valued that. Anyway, later on down the journey, so I got to 28 now, I decided to go back to kind of 18, use that BTEC and sort of bring it into the modern day and say, right, why don't you go and have a look at a university course and sort of think about the qualification? So I thought to myself, you know, I, I never really thought about it at the time because education was a little bit, football and education never, didn't really mix back then in that culture. It's a lot different in the modern day. And I thought to myself, well, if I go back to uni, it might give me something, a degree, you know, something I can move on and build on. And so I signed up to do a degree in sports science. And and from then, I've kind of done a degree and I engage. I've been, I did my teacher training qualification straight away after that because I, I really enjoyed the lecturers back then and the lectures that were happening. So you, you kind of pick this up and you think, I, I could be quite good at that. I, I could, you know, through my experiences, I like sport. Uh, I understand how people operate, uh, you know, not in a harsh manner, but my learning was, you know, caring for some of these people a little bit more and you might get a little bit more out of them, you know, the, you know, from, from experience that I had in grassroots football. So I, I kind of like, 
brought that identity with into the education scenario. And you know, before you know it, James, seventeen years later, and I'm still I'm still teaching and, and lecturing away. You know, and that that kind of crossroads or that that pivotal point in my life was like the right decision. But as I said to the Exeter City uh, media officer Scott in 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 the summer, if somebody had sat down with me at 24, I might not have wasted four years, and I might not have been drinking and gambling. I might have had a I might have found a purpose again to myself a bit quicker. So so anyway, yeah, 28 degree, done a master's degree in philosophy. I'm I'm just doing some revisions and corrections on a PhD as well. So it's it's been an educational journey that's kind of wrapped around my football identity because my PhD is based on, you know, these critical moments in the game that people don't really see, that people don't realise. You know, a lot of people just see football as running out at four o'clock on a Sunday, three o'clock on a Saturday afternoon. You know, they, they don't understand some of the, the things that you're going through. Um, some of these things around dressing room relationships, manager relationships, coach relationships, deselection is massive injuries, going on loan somewhere, they can all have impacts on the way that you think and you act and you feel. And I think there's more work that needs to be done in there from a, from a supportive perspective. There's lots of work in psychology work in the academies from nine to 18s. There's a lot of work in there, but not a lot of work at pro or first team level. And it doesn't surprise me whatsoever that players are coming out of the game at all stages with mental health issues and difficulties and, and sort of challenging times, it doesn't surprise me because a lot of footballers they don't sort of talk about things until they've after until after they finish playing. You know, a lot a lot of players don't speak about these things while they're in the game because the rewards are so high, the wages are so high. You know, if you start saying to somebody, "I'm struggling, I've got a difficulty, I'm, I'm I feel really challenged at the moment, I'm not coping." You know that that might potentially disrupt a career, and that that culture, that that kind of something's got to got to change within the game. Us will still get people, players to this day, with, with difficult mental health, challenging moments that they got to to face up to. From your point of view, when you were suffering with the gambling and the addiction, was it hard to watch football, and in particular, former teammates on the pitch, or did you did you enjoy that? that moment more the fact that you knew those players and were friends with those players how did you handle being outside of football what yeah you know? I think I always look at it and I think to myself that the thing that saddens me the most James is that I, it was just it was potential that was never realized you know and I'm not I'm not a I'm not a bitter person because you know I, I value value a lot of things that happened at United and I value the experiences that I was given but I always feel there's, there's just that little sort of almost like the devil on the shoulder isn't it about you know the, the thing that saddens me the most was my potential in football was never realized and I think I think I think that that's that's kind of the, the most heartbreaking thing really you know and um you know, there was no doubt there was there was talent there, but I think due to one thing and another, maybe due to the culture at the time, maybe due to my own personal situation, you know, maybe my confidence wasn't as high as it should be. Maybe maybe I wasn't I wasn't I wasn't made to feel as though I had a good chance of getting in the first team. I think you need someone to see something in you and push you. You know that the class of '92 did unbelievable things for Man United. You know, Premier Leagues, European Cups, Charity Shield, FA Cups, they did everything. But they had, they had a nice support and a nice backing to get their opportunity. You know, and unfortunately, not, not a lot of players get that. Um, yeah, you have, to, you have to earn it. Of course you do. But you need a chance to. You need a chance. There's no good being, being the best player in the 17s, the 80s, doing great stuff in the reses if you're not getting picked in the first team environment. You know, it, it seems to... It seems to all collapse. So you need you need someone just to pin, just to pin a little belief in you, you know, which you hear sometimes that great managers do with certain players. You need that, you know, every every player wants that and needs that. And quite often in modern football, they, they don't get that, sadly. 
Have you ever seen the film Groundhog Day? Uh, I've, I've heard. I've not seen the. I've not seen the sort of the, the kind of the full full. But I, I, I do know the kind of the the context behind it. So the synopsis of it is one day is repeated. Mm. You could repeat one day from your footballing career, like Groundhog Day. What? what would yeah. Be, Anna? I, I'd go there. So you could probably name a few here. Um, I'd probably one of my standout memories. I got to go to Exeter. And I played in a local derby. They played Plymouth Argyle, and it was what it was a Boxing Day fixture, and a lot of Exeter fans, like a lot of a lot of um, football clubs or football followers, will tell you they love the derby days. Man United, City, Liverpool, Everton, uh, Portsmouth, Southampton. So Exeter's derby is like. Plymouth and Torquay because they're like down in the in the southwest there, but Pl Plymouth's the main one. That's the one that they like getting the the kind of the bragging rights. And the particular game that I played in was everything just seems to, seemed to go well. Uh, played in the reserves on the Thursday at Cardiff City, and Bawley had come up to watch, and he he called me after the game and he said, "Right, you're going to be playing Saturday, I think it was. I think it might have been I think it might have been Wednesday the game. Sorry." And he said, I want you to do me a favour, because he, he used to use me in a little bit of man-marking rules back then. That's something that you don't really see in the modern game. You know, like putting somebody on like a, a danger player or somebody where um, the manager feels as though they're going to cause the problems. And, and his instructions was, I want you to follow Warren Joyce all over the place. Now, Warren was a fantastic player. Uh, gritty, good energy determined and he, he said that a lot of things go through Warren at Plymouth so, so your job for the derby he said he doesn't get a kick he, he said you want to you want you'll track him everywhere you get your tackles in when you can but the great thing with ball is he said like when you get the chance go and play as well go and join him so everything went well on the derby we beat him 2-0 we had three goals disallowed there was a capacity crowd in and it was one of them games where, you know, everything seemed to, to slot into place. And, you know, from a, from a sort of a, uh, an experiential sort of learning situation, like if you could sort of replay that or go back to the start of that and go through it again, that, that's kind of what my choice would be. And to cap it all off, and I've still got it to this day, I've got like Exeter City v Plymouth Argyle. I've got the man of the match trophy for that as well. So, so that, that was uh, uh, you know, a really, really nice experience to have. And, and something, if I could replay that from 10 o'clock now. The, the bizarre thing, Jez, it was an 11 o'clock kickoff that morning. And uh, it was an early start, cause, probably because of the crowd situation. We didn't want any crowd trouble and things like that. So if I could replay that from sort of 8, 9 o'clock in the morning and then cut through to like, you know, tea time, 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock afterwards, I'd, I'd go through that experience because that was, uh, that was like one that stands out uh, at the top. And another couple of bit unbelievable ones. I scored my first league goal. Uh, well, that was amazing feeling as well. Uh, first game, first goal I scored was against Stockport County. I managed to stick one in the top corner. I closed my eyes and hit it from the edge of the area. So the the feeling and the exhilaration following that was incredible. You know, like spinning away and just jumping up, and you know that was brilliant. And then I scored another goal on in front of like what Exeter's kind of called the Big Bank. That's like where all the home fans go against Reading. So that ball had come across, knocked down, I managed to slot it up. So that was a brilliant feeling as well. So, so this is this is kind of the unique feelings that football sometimes bring you that you want more of. And when your football days are finished and they're over and you're injured or you've been deselected, you know, you there's not a lot of there's not a lot of other trades or experiences that bring that level of excitement. It's like it's like adrenaline, it's like a drug, isn't it? You know, yeah, you talk about players who sort of say oh the game's shocking it's it's horrible there's lots of rubbish goes on in there that some of the some of the behaviors are appalling blah 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 but if they say well could you go back and live it again you'd be there in a shot so i think that that's always like really strange and i had that one of my studies on my phd you start talking to all these players 212 x pros and they're saying oh difficult times critical moments deselection injury left out horrible blah 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 and then the last question was, if you could do it again, would you? And about 94% of the sample said they go back in a heartbeat. So that, that's always like a, quite a funny, a funny and interesting uh, finding that, that came out, that came to light. Now, if we had a magic wand and we could correct a decision you made, 
change a decision you made or make a decision that you didn't make in your footballing career, what one decision would you change or not change, so to speak? That, that's so tough. That's really tough because if I was giving advice to a young player coming through the system now, I would say just be careful on letting your heart rule your head because sometimes what you think's right for you at the time might not be right. So I would sort of suggest that maybe seeing the value in going looking at different clubs and, and see what coaching player relationships you can build at those clubs. The real challenging thing to me and probably where it hit home the most is I love Man United. I was a fan all my life. So I would say that my identity to United, James, is maybe unhealthy. It's maybe very, very strong. And it's like, a, it's like a relationship going wrong, isn't it? And when United kind of betrayed you in a way, or let's, let's put it in parlance, they almost cheated on you. It's like the impact of that going forward. It's like you still love them, but you just got to accept it. Haven't? There's nothing you can do about it. So I don't know. I, I stuck to my values, James. I, I kind of like when I got released from United, there was a lot of players at the time. They were nicking kit and taking training gear and, and taking stuff off the club and all that. And I thought, that's not for me. That it, it wasn't. It wasn't really what I was about. So within within the depths of sadness and disappointment, you've got to remain true to who you are as well. Because if I'd have done that, that would have been me being somebody else, like inauthentic, if that makes sense. So. The real difficult one for me would be, was my choice going to United the right one? Not from a, I want to do it because I love United, but maybe the environment and the culture and the training player relationship, coach relationship, maybe I could have done better elsewhere and worked my way up. But this is all in retrospect, James, and it's all in hindsight. It's easy in hindsight, isn't it? I mean, a lot of people say to you, how the hell can you turn around at 40 and a half and United want to sign and you say, oh, I'll just hang on and just see what Bolton are going to do and things like that. But you, you only learn that. You only learn that on your journey. So, you know, that that's probably the best way I could answer that. I've got to say, I've thoroughly enjoyed talking to you about your career today. Thank you for sharing your experiences in football and in life. And like I said, I find it hugely motivational to see how you've overcome the setbacks that you've been dealt because you've had enough setbacks that would probably crumble most men, most humans. And to, to keep on fighting adversity the way you have and to keep on being successful in your chosen fields, I, I find it hugely inspirational. So I just want to say thank you very much for sharing your story. Yeah, <clears throat> thanks, James. It's, it's been a delight to, to speak to you. Well, thanks for inviting me on. You know, a lot of people say to me, like, what's, what's, the, what's the greatest moment of your career? And I probably say to him, not playing for United, not playing for Exeter. I would probably say something like, the best moment was um, picking myself up and moving on. I appreciate that. Because that, that's, you know, what, what could you do in life? You've got to take the blows, James, and you've got to try and move forward as best as you can. Simple. So thank you ever so much for your time today. And um, hopefully we get a chance to catch up again real soon in the future. Yeah, cheers, James. Thank you. Thanks so much. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you, Alan. Take care.